Hi and welcome to C3 Church Online. It's so good to be here. My name is Bernie and I'm a part of the team at C3 Hobart. My goodness, what a week we have all had in our families and communities, right? In my family alone, I've got one child that's getting ready to go back to school. Got to tell you, I'm a little excited about that. And uh, my husband and I, we're getting ready to go back into the office and our daughter Bailey, she's ramping up for work. But the truth is we're all at different stages in this return to a new normal, really, aren't we? And, you know, I can't help but think about the people in our church, and there are many of you that are our essential workers, our health services, our teachers, our bus drivers. You've just been incredible and haven't missed a beat. We just want to honour you and pray for you and that you really are strengthened and blessed in this time with a huge refreshing. We couldn't be here doing what we're doing now without the effort of your service to us every day throughout this time. Something else that I'm really excited about is that I get to drink coffee outside of my own house and my own street, which is pretty cool because the Rivulet Cafe is now open for all of us. We can go in and uh, grab a coffee to take away, or it's open for up to 10 people. So if you get in there and you're one of those 10, you can grab a table and sit down. It's gonna be so cool to see people in our church building again, and we are just loving that. Now we're gonna prepare for something that's going to happen a little later in the service, and that's communion. So, Now's the opportunity, you can go into your pantry, you can have a look for any crackers that might be in the back there, a bit of bread, some wine or a bit of juice, and bring that so that you can share it and we can join communion together a little later on. Really looking forward to that. Now we're gonna prepare for a time of offering. And I wanna set this up really as you start to get ready to think about how you're gonna give today with a story from my family. Now we are really into celebrating in our house and we've actually just had my youngest son, he's just turned 16. Now since he was a little tacker, he has played Lego all of his life. You know, I have helped him make kits, I have watched him, I've stood on Lego, not quite as bad as what we saw with Jaren a few weeks ago with her forehead, but I have helped in making Lego. Anyway, uh, I was looking at him, he got this amazing gift, which all of the family, extended family, put into, and it's this extraordinary big kit, which is apparently meant to take him about three months to complete. It took him about two weeks. So I said to Flynn and my family, you know what, I've helped a lot with Lego but I've actually never had the opportunity of having my own kit. And so I left it at that, feeling a bit sorry for myself. Anyway, this week, Steve and Bay, they went out to the shop and they came back and presented me with my very own kit. And I have it right here. It's, a C it's the Lego City model. And so I didn't waste a moment. As soon as I got this model, it was night time. I cleared the table after tea, set aside um, the whole space and I set to work on my Lego City model. Now it took me about an hour and a half. I was so proud of myself. I came up with a boat with some marine creatures and then I looked at Flynn who has just completed this magnificent structure with mine in front of me and said to him, you know, I had myself winning Lego Masters at this point, church, and said to him, you know what, I think that I'm ready to advance to the next level. And then Flynn turned to me and reminded me that, Mum, have a look at the box. The age level that it says on it is five plus, and it is. So <laughs> maybe I'm not quite making the big sophisticated ships yet um, from Star Wars. Millennium Falcon's gonna have to wait. But I think that there is, despite me doing well with my five plus model, I think there's a bit of a message in us for that, for all of us. It actually says in the word, don't despise small beginnings. So as you start to get ready to give today, you'll see up on the screen different ways that you can give. That's gonna come up and prepare yourself for that. But in Luke 16, verse 10, it says, whoever can be trusted with the very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with the very little will also be dishonest with much. 
I just know it's a principle of God that when you give the little, some of us have lost jobs, some of us have more income than we've ever had, but when we give our 10%, our little that we can give, we will be blessed in the much, in our giving, in our provision, in our talent and our skills. So I'm gonna pray for you as we give. Lord Jesus, I thank you for each person that is giving today. I thank you, Father, that you honour them as they give with their little, what they can give at this time to your kingdom, and that you will trust them with much. In Jesus' name. Done 
for me Welcome to C3 Church Online, where I am preaching from our South Hobart location. We cannot wait to be meeting together again, and it will come. It will come. But uh, in the meantime, we are so proud of our online services that we're putting out, where of our connection points and our C3 Cares team, who are doing a really great job. If you have recently joined us online and haven't actually got to one of our services, we would love you after the service to both subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can continually get notification about what we're doing and also go to our website and leave us your contact details because we can't physically come at the moment and exchange details and get to know you like that. So please, after the service, just um, go to our website, c3hobart.org.au and leave your details for us. Our vision statement is to reach people on a journey of faith and to build strong followers of Christ. Simply put, we want to reach and build people because they matter to us. And at times we'll get it wrong. At times we will miss the person standing right in front of us. At times we will not see the, those standing in the corner the quiet ones. We won't reach everybody. Yet, Morella and I are really proud of leading a team that is willing to meet people no matter where they are on their faith journey. And it's this faith journey that I want to talk about today. As part one of a series that we're calling Contagious. And this is in no way mocking the COVID season or what has been a very unsettling experience for so many people. Yet the reason that we have been in isolation for the last 60 to 70 days is because the, this particular strain of disease that, that is going around the world is highly infectious. And so therefore, we don't want to spread it to other people. We want to, we're told to stay at home because even if we have it, we need to keep it to ourselves and not give it to others. Yet the faith hope and love that is found in Jesus is worth spreading to others. In fact, in one of Jesus's final messages before he ascended to heaven, he said to his disciples, go into the world and spread the good news. Don't hide it. In fact, share it. Share what I have done for you with others in order that they too may know and receive the gift. The challenge is that we don't think we're worthy or that we don't think we're a certain way on a faith journey where we can share with others. Over the next 23 minutes, I'm going to share how no matter where you are on your own faith journey, that you can be a spreader of faith that will transform the lives of others. So grab your Bible, grab a notepad or a journal, a pen or a highlighter, and let's go. The first point is that we need to be transformable. Be transformable. In Mark chapter 1 verse 26 to uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 16 to 20, it says this as Jesus was walking along the shore of Lake Galilee, he noticed two brothers fishing, Simon and Andrew. He watched them. God watches. God is watching us all the time. He watched them as they were casting their nets into the sea. And he said to them, come follow me and I will transform you into men who catch people instead of fish. Immediately they dropped their nets and left everything behind to follow Jesus. Verse 19, walking a little further, Jesus found two other brothers sitting in a boat along with their father mending their nets. Their names were John, and James and John and their father Zebedee. Jesus immediately walked up to them and invited the two brothers to become his followers. At once, James and John dropped their nets, stood up, left their father in the boat with the hired men and following Jesus. Growing up, I wanted to be a person that had a testimony of a radical transformation. 
I was in a band and uh, we got asked to follow or to support a, uh, a Sydney Christian rock band called Guns of Fire on a tour that they did. And I remember during this tour that the lead singer, Anthony Hook, who had lived a, a life of sex, drugs and rock and roll, shared of his testimony how he radically found Jesus while serving time in a three by three metre cell in Long Bay Jail. And now here he was sharing his faith on the stage every night with thousands of people. To me, this was a faith that was, that was real, that was radical, that was transforming others. And I was almost embarrassed of my testimony, which was giving my life to Jesus at a youth camp on the shores of Lake Epilock with 20 other youth kids where I stood up my hand and walked to the front. In the scripture I read just a little bit earlier, Simon also called Peter and his brother Andrew and James and his brother John were minding their own business doing what they were called to do, which was to be fishermen. When Jesus comes along and says, I will transform you into those who will spread the good news. Now, the image we can often get of this is that Jesus is walking along the sea, walking along the shore of the, the Sea of Galilee, and there's, there's just two boats there. There's, you know, there's Andrew and, and, and his brother and James and his brother. And so Jesus says, well, well there's only two boats. I'll, I'll call both of them. Well, I was always taught, I'm not a fisherman, but I was always taught that fishermen will fish where there are fish. And so I've got a fair idea that there was boats everywhere in this area, yet Jesus knew who he was going to call because he knew who would have a faith that could transform others. He also knew who would respond to a faith and be transformable. Anthony Hook shared with me one night, that he had felt God calling him many times. In fact, he grew up in a, in a youth group just like I did, and that he knew seeds had been sown into his heart, but his heart was hardened, and, his, and faith cannot grow in a heart that is hardened and, is, and, and, and a heart that is not ready to receive and be transformed. A faith that changes others comes from a heart that is willing to be transformed. The second point is to be expectant. First point is be transformable. And the second point is be expectant. There's a story of a, of a small rural town that was in the middle of a significant drought. And this was a community that relied on rain. In fact, it was said that over 70% of, of the townsfolk were, were, were directly reliant on rain for their crops and the remainder of the townsfolk were reliant on them getting good crops in order that the town functioned properly. It had been nearly three years since they had received adequate rain. And on another dry and cloudless Wednesday night, the local church pastor sent out a call to the church community to, to assemble at 6pm in the main car park with the intent on praying for rain. As the time grew closer, many folks started arriving. In fact, they arrived in their hundreds. It was reported that this was the biggest prayer meeting that had ever been seen in the district, all with the intent of praying for rain. As the pastor walked to the front of the building to officially begin the meeting, he noticed a young 11-year-old girl standing off to the side of the group with her mum and dad. And in her hands was a gigantic, colourful umbrella. The pastor looked around and he saw that she was the only one holding an umbrella. You see, many had come to pray for rain, but a young girl, full of faith, came expectant that God would answer her prayers. I once heard it said that a faith hidden robs others of its glory. And Jesus' own brother, James, goes pretty hard on this. In James chapter 2, verse 14 to, to 17, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, what good is it if someone claims to have a faith but demonstrates no good works to prove it? How could this faith save anyone, he goes on to say. For example, if a brother or sister of the, in the faith is poorly clothed or, or hungry and you leave them saying goodbye, I hope you stay warm and have plenty to eat, but you do not provide them with a coat and a, even a cup of soup, what good is your faith? Faith is not based 
on actions. You cannot earn salvation by serving and obeying God. But what James is saying is that faith has an output. Faith that sees you bring an umbrella to a, a prayer meeting that is praying for rain is contagious to others. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and insurance about what we do not see. A young girl could not see the rain, but she knew that she was praying for rain, so she's going to bring an umbrella so she doesn't get wet. If you want to be contagious in your faith, be expectant. Bring your umbrella and watch others grow in their own faith. The third one is to be an overcomer. So be transformable, be expectant and be an overcomer. One of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is the story of the Samaritan woman who in a single encounter with Jesus is filled with such a contagious faith that she, she embraces the very people to which she's isolated from. The story goes that this woman is, is out fetching water in the middle of the day. Now, culture would say that, that the ladies of the town would go out twice a day in the early morning and late at evening when it was cooler in the day to fetch water. And the story that we find in John chapter 4 is that they, they were going to Jacob's well, which was probably about half a mile or maybe, maybe a kilometre from the township. So it was actually hard work. And it was fairly boring work. And, and in this story, we find that this Samaritan woman is going there at midday. She's isolated from her community. And whether that was self-imposed from the actions that she has done, we hear that she uh, had, had been in adulterous affairs. Or whether it was self-imposed by a community, it doesn't matter. She was away from her social structures. Day after day, she undertook this task. And I'm sure there was moments where she felt anger. I'm sure there were moments where she felt upset. I'm sure there were moments where she felt shame. Yet this is the beautiful part about Jesus is that she is that Jesus met this woman where she was at. In John chapter four, verse nine, it says the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. If we skip down to verse 25 to 27, it says, The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am him. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or, or why are you talking with her? Jesus met a Samaritan woman who was friendless and out of favor. I mean, even the disciples kind of said, well, we don't want to associate it with this situation. But Jesus saw a woman, saw in this woman a faith that would not only transform her life, but the very people to which she was isolated from. But to do this, she needed a faith that would overcome. In verse 28, we read, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? You see, I said at the start that, that we are so proud of a church culture where we meet people on their faith journey no matter where they're at. This woman was no theologian. She's not even sure if this was the Messiah. She says, could this be the Messiah? Verse 30, it says, they came out of their town and made their way towards him. And then it says in verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. And the fourth point is to be bold. Others are watching. During this time of isolation, I've been immersing myself in the story of Daniel. And I want to encourage you, uh, read the first six chapters of Daniel. Let me start from Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. 
And the Lord delivered Joachim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple. Verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenath, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defects, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Ashpenath was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after they that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those chosen was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Theologian R.C. Sproul once said this, The issue of faith is not so much whether we believe in God, but whether in times of challenge that we can believe in the God that we said we believe in. And during this time, many of us have been taken out of our comfort zones and away from our friendship groups and away from the way we do life. And it has been a challenging environment. For many, we haven't been able to visit family because they might live interstate or even intrastate. And it's, and it's, and it's been a situation that can be quite challenging for us. Yet here we find Daniel and three young boys standing before the chief of staff of the king, who's telling them that this is what you must do. Yet in verse 8, Daniel says, Daniel, it says, resolved not to defile himself. Now I want you to put yourselves in the, in the sandals of these three young boys standing alongside Daniel. As he is telling a chief official that he was not going to do what was asked of him. I reckon they were elbowing him in the ribs and muttering in their native tongue for him just, just to be quiet. Let's just do this. They're offering us good food. Yet when Daniel muttered those words, little did he know how contagious his faith would be on those three young men standing beside him. Because as we go on in the story, we read that, that uh, the three young men and Daniel all did very well. And they're put in positions of power in King Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Yet King Nebuchadnezzar was kind of a weird dude. He had this serious pride issue. And so he builds this 90-foot statue of gold in his own image. And he tells everybody in his palace and his officials and his government people that they have to bow down before his, his statue. The story will go that these three same boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel was not with them at this point, that they will refuse to bow down. And they're brought before the king. They're brought before King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar, who it says is furious with rage, summons them. And he said to them, you must bow down before my throne, before my, my statue. Or if not, I will throw you into the furnace. In verse 16, it says this of chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And then comes one of, what I believe is one of the, my most favorite moments of faith in the whole Bible. In verse 18, it says this, But... If not, even if we die in the furnace, we will never serve your gods. We will never worship the golden image that you have set up. It's at times like this that you're thankful for the boldness of someone like David, who, of Daniel, who had a contagious faith. Daniel, who stood there with three young boys and with a faith that would last a lifetime. For some of you, your faith journey starts right now. You're watching church for the very first time. And God has spoken to you through these stories. God has spoken to you through the story of a young girl standing there expectant that God will bring rain. Standing there God has spoken to you through the story of four fishermen who were called and lives were transformed. God has, has spoken to you through the story of Daniel 
and three young teenage boys who refused to defile God, who refused to bow down to any idols. No matter where you are on your faith journey, I want to tell you that God has given us a faith that is to be contagious to others. And you may have been coming to church for many years and you've been hiding your faith away. Or maybe it's just a personal faith that's been sitting inside, yet you've never had the courage to be able to share with others. Yet God has spoken to you today that it's time to step out for Jesus, that it's time to share that faith. And you may not feel equipped, you may not feel worthy, Maybe you feel like that Samaritan woman that is isolated and has been wronged by the community. You see, that same Samaritan woman went back into her town and because of her testimony, a whole community believed. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer and it's going to come up on the screen and I would love for you to pray that with me. And then at the end of the service, to go to, to c3hobart.org.au and to, to tell us that you've responded to this, no matter where you are on your faith journey, because we would love to be able to pray with you. So I'm going to ask you where you are to just repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and rising from the dead to give me life. I repent of my sins and turn to you. Today, I choose to follow you with all of my heart for the rest of my life. I believe in you and declare that you are the leader and the Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving me and walking with me from this moment forward. God bless and amen.
This is how I fight my battles It may look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you It may look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you It may look like I'm surrounded But I'm Like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. to give the communion message. So why is a question that many parents have heard more times than they want. And it's a question that I'm going to ask today as we think about Jesus dying on the cross outside Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago. Why? Why did Jesus have to die? Well, to answer that, I need to go back to the beginning. When God created the world, the Bible tells us that it was good. There was no sorrow, no suffering, no pain, and no death. There was just Adam and Eve who talked daily with God in the garden as he walked with them in the cool of the evening, in the garden that he had made for them and to work in. And yes, they did work, and yes, it was good. But then, something tragic happened. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They ate the fruit of a tree that God had told them not to eat. Disobeying God is called sin, and sin brought its consequences. The consequence was enormous. They could no longer live in the garden that God had especially made for them. They had to toil rather than to work. Romans 6 verse 23 says, The wages or consequences of sin is death, and with it sickness, sorrow, pain, suffering, and decay. This was not just a physical death, but also a spiritual death. The end of that ability to have unrestricted relationship with God. I'm sure that Adam and Eve asked themselves many times, why? Why did we do it? Having done it, having brought sin into the world, Adam and Eve were powerless to change it all back. 
only God could do anything. His justice demanded that the punishment for sin be fully paid, so he couldn't just brush it all away and pretend it didn't happen. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. God had a plan. It was a good plan, but it was also a costly plan. It would cost him something that was incredibly precious to him. The unending close relationship with his son Jesus. Being such a costly plan, God needed to wait until it was the right time to put his plan into action. In the meantime, God prepared. He worked through the descendants of Abraham, the people of Israel. He taught them his principles and set up the Passover from which we derive our modern Easter. The lamb that was sacrificed at the Passover had to be without defect, or in the King James Version, without spot or blemish. By doing this, God showed us that the one who took the penalty for our sin had to be perfect without spot or blemish. There's just no way that we could do that for ourselves. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. So when the time was right, God's son Jesus left heaven, became a fetus, grew in Mary's womb, and was born as a baby. Jesus grew up and began telling people about his father God and about God's plan. He kept in regular contact with his father. Luke 5.16 tells us Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He showed us the kind of relationship Father God wants to have with each one of us. All Jesus' human life, he was spotless and without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he was without sin. Only Jesus was without defect and so an acceptable sacrifice to take the penalty for our sin. As Jesus was dying on the cross, he took upon himself all our sin. He was cut off from Father God at this time. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities or sins have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And so Jesus called out in Matthew 27 verse 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt the full penalty of our sin, separation from Father God. So I ask another why. Why did God do this? Why was he willing to pay such a huge price? Romans 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There is only one answer to this why. God was willing to pay such a high price for us because God is love. 1 John 4 verse 14 and 15 says, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Today, as we partake of the bread and the juice, let's remember that God gave his son Jesus, the only one who was perfect and without blemish, the only acceptable sacrifice for our sin. Jesus was willing to temporarily lose that close relationship with Father God so that we could gain it for eternity. He did this because he is love. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you came and you gave your life so that we could be in heaven with God forever and ever.
For this we will be eternally grateful. Thank you. Wow, Sheila. That was beautiful. How good is it, Church, to see each other's faces again popping up on our screens? It's just so good, I love it. Well, now's the time of the service where I would usually say, if I was up on stage, to pass your cups to the end of the row. But how about you pass your cups, kids, to your dad? Or how about um, the kids, I hear all the parents say, no, pass your cups to the kids. Or maybe you're just at home on your own and you just put your cup on the bench until the end of the day. I don't need to work out how you're going to get rid of your communion cups, but thank you for having communion with us. It's just amazing to come around to communion together. I can't wait to see you guys next week, but in the meantime, don't miss out on Pastor Sean's Instagram Live. That's on Thursday night this week, and it has been amazing. He's been interviewing some cracking people, and you're going to hear something really encouraging for this time in our lives. So we'll see you Thursday night on Instagram Live. See you on Sunday when we're online again, and have a brilliant week.